Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us. My name is Brian Sloan. I'm the acting chair of the Cambridge Socio Legal Group, and I'm absolutely delighted to see so many people here for what is our second webinar of the term. I'm particularly delighted that we've got uh, May Hen Smith joining us all the way from the Cayman Islands. I'm sure she'll tell us it's not quite as nice as it sounds in some way, but I'm delighted that she's been able to join us this evening. I'll let her introduce herself a little bit more, but she is a PhD candidate in sociology here at Cambridge and a member of Jesus College. You'll see from the bio that she circulated that she's had a wealth of experience in practice in this area and no doubt that that has been a fundamental aspect of what led her to do her doctoral research. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to say a few thank yous. One is to Daniel Bates, my colleague in the faculty, who's been instrumental in setting all of this up. Um, and I'd also like to thank my colleagues in the Centre for Tax Law at Cambridge, particularly Peter Harris and Dominic de Cogan for their support of this seminar. One final thing I'd like to do before we get on to the technical things is to say, well, if you have joined us via a mechanism other than the Socio Legal Group, I'm going to share a link in the chat so that you can sign up for our mailing list for news of future events. I think, May, you're going to speak for about 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions. What we're going to do is to allow you to raise your hand when it gets the questions, and we'll then use the features of the software, hopefully, to be able to allow you to turn on your audio and ask your question verbally. If that doesn't work for any reason, there's also a Q&A feature whereby you can type your question for May, but we'll worry about that, I think, uh, when we get to it. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to pass over to May Hen Smith uh, to give her presentation on the repatriation of offshore finance to onshore transnational legal orders and the Cayman Islands experience. So thank you very much, May. Um, well, thank you, Brian, for having me, and thank you to the Social Legal Group for um, having this wonderful event um, online now. Um, I thought I would begin with my background uh, and how I got into this field, uh, and then I'll start to talk about my research and how it developed and the methodology, the theory, and the findings. And I'll preface it with the findings up front, just in case you guys want the uh, two-minute sort of uh, elevator speech. So um, I started actually as a tax collector in 2008, uh, um, first as a, just a regular um, tax agent at the Canada Revenue Agency. Um, so uh, there I worked on the phones for about a year and a half, answering tax calls from taxpayers from across Canada for um, electronic and business filing, um, benefit services, and sort of various tax questions. And I would talk to people about, uh, you know, let's say about 20 people per hour um, on an average day. Uh, and so I, I got to, you know, really talk to quite a few people across Canada about, about just tax in general. From there, I moved on to revenue collections as a tax collector uh, for a few years. Um, and I finished after about four and a half years in total, uh, where actually most of our time was spent writing and collectible tax debt. Um, and Canada Revenue Agency mandates that the collectors at the time uh, spend about uh, half, at least half their time, uh, writing off tax debt that cannot be collected anymore, either because the money has been um, gone, the person's become bankrupt, or you can't find the money anymore it's, or because it's out of reach. And that really piqued my interest at the time. And I realized that, you know, if we we're spending our time writing off all this uncollectible tax debt, and, you know, when we weren't, we were going after plum plumbers and dentists and doctors um, who, who couldn't, you know, pay their tax debt, you know, but by the time we focused all of our efforts on these sort of small amounts, uh, you know, we could have gotten some pretty big fish. And so at the time I thought, you know, why don't we go look for the ultimate tax protester, the tax evader, and 
obviously they must be in tax havens. Uh, and so that's when I began my study uh, during my undergrad to look at tax protesters. From there, I did a master's in communications in Canada at Simon Fraser on, uh, on the Cayman Islands as an offshore financial center. And what I really did there was an anthropology and basically how it went from a maritime economy, they were seamen, they were fishermen, they were sailors, uh, uh, thatch rope makers, turtlers, uh, people ate turtle uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago, uh, and, and how they went from that up until the 1960s to an offshore financial center. And what you realize is that, you know, there was politics involved in that uh, around that time, a lot of colonies were becoming independent um, from mostly European uh, rulers. And uh, the Cayman Islands decided that it did not want to become a uh, independent, um, independent of its of, of of the UK. And so, uh, what what the Foreign Office did at the time was that it said, you know, if you want to become uh, or remain part of us, you need to have your own viable economy. And so, it gave the Cayman Islands the tools to develop as a banking center. And sort of that sort of had, um, that and other. Um, reasons is how it developed as an offshore financial center. And so I write about that in a book chapter that I'll, I'll make available um, after this talk, uh, uh, along with another compilation of other books on offshore and elites and, and sort of the development of offshore financial centers. There are a lot of historians who write about the development of offshore financial centers, particularly the banking. Um, there's one on the development of uh, banking in offshore through Barclays uh, in offshore. Uh, and so that's another field in itself. Um, during my time, uh, at my, during my time, uh, my master's field work, I spent about a year in the Cayman Islands uh, interviewing people. And I didn't really have that much success. I was able to interview a lot of people in the tourism industry, um, a, a lot of people working at the restaurants, bars, scuba divers, uh, and dive masters, because there's a lot of scuba diving down here. But I couldn't really get to the financial center because they just weren't accessible. And it was just after the you know, 2008 financial crisis, there was a lot of talk about tax havens and nobody really wanted to talk about, uh, about uh, you know, sort of tax and the relation to tax in the Cayman Islands. It was the last thing you wanted to talk about. And so I realized when I did the history of the islands that a lot of people who founded the islands and you know, key members who really developed the island were actually from Cambridge specifically. Uh, when you think of Maples and Calder, one of the uh, best known law firms in the Cayman Islands, uh, you know, John Maples uh, is British and Douglas Calder is, is British and they were both Cambridge alumni um, and they met in Cambridge and they, they came down to Cayman and they developed Maples and Calder, which if you're not familiar with that name, is, uh, was famously pointed out to by Obama at the Uglin House for having, uh, you know, tens of thousands of registrations in one building. Um, William S. Walker, the Walker's law firm, is now a, a very popular uh, law firm down here, also um, considered one of the founders of the offshore financial industry here, also a Cambridge alumni. Uh, and judges, uh, uh, David Hayton of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, who supports a lot of the products that offshore produces, particularly purpose trusts, uh, very different from charitable purpose trusts, but this was called a commercial purpose trust. Um, also from Cambridge, and so there was this connection. Uh, and I realized that if I really wanted to access these networks, I really had to go to the place to get to these networks. And so that's actually why I applied to Cambridge in order to access these, these people and these networks. And um, anecdotally, uh, it worked, uh, because within about five or six weeks of arriving in Cambridge in 2015, um, I was invited by the Cambridge Canadian Club to meet the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, uh, and uh, only Oxford and LSE students uh, at the Canada House and in a pub afterwards where a group of us got to personally and Mark Carney, uh, the Governor of the Bank of England, and, and other people. And so it, it sort of began this pathway of realizing that not only do these interesting networks work, uh, but they may actually get me into the top echelons of uh, you know, the financial industry in the Cayman Islands. Um, and so that sort of uh, prefaces my start there. Um, it took a while for me to figure out the methodology on how I'd study the Cayman Islands because of how sensitive people were. They were, they were very conflicted in talking to people because uh, there had been so many media publications about what they did and how they 
presented themselves. Um, and so they were always obviously quite, quite on the defensive. And it was a challenging way to understand them as either elites or or to frame them as, uh, you know, something the political economy would uh, might might frame them as, uh, uh, as you know, networks of power. Um, and I realized that, it, and only until I actually started doing field work a year later, where I spent about thirteen months in total there, uh, that that it was actually easier to break it down by industry. And there was a lot of um, uh, hit or misses. I I, I tried to sign up for as many of the local events as possible. I went to the Society of Trust and Estate Planners conferences, and I went to as many uh, industry conferences as I could uh, or could afford to go to. Uh, these events are usually three days at the Ritz-Carlton, where they cost about you know $500 a day, so about $1,500 per event. Um, but you really got to talk to these practitioners. Um, and so at first, um, it was difficult because the language of each conference was very different. These were hedge funds, trust companies, uh, captive insurance, um, uh, bankruptcy insolvency and restructuring specialists. So when a hedge fund or a, or a Ponzi scheme you know, happens like the um, uh, Bernie Madoff case, for example, Bernie had a lot of uh, assets in the Cayman Islands and so when that all defaulted and he went and, and bankrupt and, and liquidations happened, uh, the lawyers in Cayman had to step in and take care of the unwinding of all these assets. And so while, uh, you think of the Cayman Islands as an offshore financial center, uh, you have to think of it as a center much like London or New York, which has very distinct pockets of specializations. And one of the things that people don't realize is that while banking was a very big part of these offshore centers, they're all now specializing in individual um, specializations that they've become good at. Um, and so there is a joke amongst uh, uh, People sort of didn't know about um, BVI, that the uh, Chinese word for companies is BVI. And so BVI is very well known for companies' registration, registrations, uh, particularly with the Chinese and I think Russians. Um, the uh, Bermuda, for example, is very popular for uh, reinsurance, which is the insurance of insurance companies. And so that's been its sort of uh, specialization. Um, and then the Cayman Islands uh, has become the largest domicile in the world for hedge funds and also for captive insurance, which I'll explain in a bit, uh, but also for uh, trusts, uh, special purpose vehicles, and a place to do business um, that can't be, uh, to, a place to conduct transactions that aren't normally um, easily done in onshore jurisdictions. Um, so I've gone off on a bit of a tangent, but I'll go to maybe a brief introduction or a uh, uh, on, on the Cayman Islands itself as, as, as to what it is and how big it is. Uh, so it's, it's only about 250, sorry, 350, 250 square kilometers. Um, and it's a very small British overseas territory, so it's British. Um, it's made up of three islands, Little Cayman, Cayman Brac, and Grand Cayman, which is the primary island where most, most people are, are living in. Uh, and the population is about 60,000 people with it split evenly between expats and locals. So there are about 37,000 expats, 30,000 locals, or 30,000 Caymanians. Um, and that's based on uh, statistics from the, you know, their population statistics office. And so the Cayman Islands is unique in that it's, it's all volcanic rock, uh, and there was little arable land, and they couldn't uh, do a lot of uh, planting there. And so unlike Jamaica and other islands in the area, they didn't have a, a plantation economy, which meant that they didn't have slaves or as many slaves uh, to, uh, to, to operate on the land. And so that developed uh, a different kind of culture compared to other places in that the, 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 the racism and the slavery and the things that came with slavery uh, weren't as pronounced uh, as they were in other islands. And that sort of um, contributes to why it remained a, a, a horse, decided to remain an overseas territory at the time. The Canadian culture and the population were, um, were, were actually quite proud to, to have this British affiliation. Um, and so really, um, uh, the other thing about the, the, the Cayman Islands is that it, it, it operates on a British system of, of government and law and British common law. Uh, their highest court of appeal in the Cayman court system is the Privy Council in the UK. 
which is seen by Caymanians as uh, the islands as advantageous in that, in that it ensures uh, familiarity, stability, and particularly uh, political protections um, afforded to those seeking this British system of rule and regulation. Um, and then the other obvious feature is that it doesn't have a levy personal or corporate income tax. And so that makes it advantageous and attractive for, for many people to do these financial transactions down here. Um, stamp duty and other things, the cost of living here is quite high, I would say similar to London and uh, Switzerland, if not slightly more. Uh, but that means that the, the kind of talent that you attract down here, um, and it's developed over the last 20 year, Whereas previously you could have attracted uh, bankers and accountants who would do uh, work that was uh, low paying for, um, you know, average size or low paying companies. You, you can't do that as you developed um, to retain these, these people. And so what you've noticed is that when I say these islands have become to specialize in certain financial products, you notice the financial products that they specialize in, reinsurance for Bermuda, um, companies registrations for BVI and hedge funds for Cayman are all very, very expensive and very highly concentrated financial products, uh, you know, billions and billions of dollars, which means the fees that these uh, legal teams will, will, will take from them are going to be able to satisfy, you know, the, the quality and the caliber of talent that they're going to be able to retain in Cayman, but also draw from the UK and from Australia and other common law based countries with common law practitioners uh, to the island. And so you see this culture of uh, trying to uh, do something in the financial industry that's both um, prestigious, advantageous, and um, you know, high paying enough to be able to satisfy the needs of people doing this, this type of work. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, a couple of areas that I've, I've focused on, and I guess I forgot to go back to the Coles notes. So if, you, if you're done with this now and you want to know basically um, my findings, is that I studied the Cayman Islands based on the hedge funds industries, captive insurance industry. Captive insurance means uh, the insurance that, uh, that companies purchase on behalf of themselves. Basically, what it means is that if you're a nuclear power plant, um, or if you're a hospital and you've got specialist insurance needs that regular retail insurers wouldn't either normally insure because it's an unusual high risk um, um, type of insurance in that they've got very little information on it or when disaster hits, it's you know incredibly unprofitable to pay out. Um, you're, what you're going to do is you're going to group together with other um, offshore oil rigs, other nuclear power plants, plants or other hospitals to start your own private insurance group. And what you'll do there is that you'll pay these premiums and then you'll use these premiums to reinvest into whatever you want so that um, you can manage your own insurance and your own insurance products. Um, and then the other uh, thing I looked at was bankruptcy and insolvency and restructuring. What happens when things go wrong in an offshore financial center? Do people follow global bankruptcy um, practices and what's expected? You know, when uh, the Madoff case, for example, you know, threw up everywhere, um, did Cayman lawyers practice in, 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 a, in, a, in a way that was expected by global bankruptcy norms and regimes? Um, and, and they did. Um, and so what I found amongst all these three groups was that basically they were practicing um, to a, a pretty high standard. Uh, but also what you were noticing that uh, was that they were forming these, these industries and these practices and passing these laws in Cayman where you can you know, pass laws a lot more easily than in a larger jurisdiction. And that these laws were actually pr pretty good in that uh, people in onshore jurisdictions were, were looking at these practices and these laws and the profits that were being generated by offshore and then copying and pasting basically bits of what they liked about Cayman law, BVI law, or Bermuda law, and then repatriating those laws back to their own individual home states or back to London. And so the three examples I'm gonna talk about, or the two exa three examples I'll talk about, um, is first in trusts. In the trust case, uh, the, you know, the, the charitable purpose trust has so much history attached to it from the Crusades. And, and that means that if you ever wanted to change a part of the trust, which is the concept of the trust, 
you wouldn't be able to do that in, U in the UK without a you know significant pushback by entrenched and you know old school trust scholars. And so what was happening in in this case was that basically um, uh, people wanted commercial purpose trusts, and so in a in a in a, in a regular trust uh, um, situation, there's a there's a settler, there's a beneficiary, and then there's a trustee. The settler is the person that puts the money into the, or the asset into the trust. So the trust is a black box. And then there's the, um, the, the beneficiary, the person that benefits from whatever gets put into that trust. Uh, and then there's the trustee who manages that. And so in, in commercial situations, when there's no uh, person as a beneficiary, maybe it's a company that's a beneficiary, um, there is no need for, for that type of, um, there, there was, there, there, there was seen that there was no need for this type of traditional trust product because there were too many restrictions on them. And so eventually what happened was that a lot of them moved offshore for offshore solutions to onshore problems that, that just weren't re regulatorily ready um, for, for it. Uh, and so you, you see the creation of something called a Star Trust in the Cayman Islands, a Vista Trust in the British Virgin Islands, and uh, Bermuda has something similar as well. Um, but I'll talk about the Star Trust because uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting concept in that uh, the Star Trust stands for uh, Special special Trusts, um, I can, sorry, I can't remember the acronym, but basically it's a special purpose trust and it was developed by somebody named Anton Duckworth, uh, who is also from Cambridge. Uh, and basically the idea was to turn the trust on its head. Anything you couldn't do with the trust, you could now do with this Star Trust. And of course, there was a lot of pushback, and you'll see that there was actually a bit of an academic debate between um, some uh, British trust uh, scholars and Anton, and they were called the Star Wars. If you if you search that, you'll see a couple of academic articles about it. And the the interesting about that was that when it was introduced, and any small country can produce any law and pass it uh, within a few days, and that doesn't make King unique. You know, it was able to create some laws and pass it. But it doesn't mean people are going to, to, to uptake it. But the reason why this was taken up and, and the reason why this was so popular was because Cayman already had a base of bankers and, and sort of a financial industry. So that means they had the, the, the rich, the clientele with the money and the assets and the products and the problems that, that could have used this product, the Star Trust. And these problems don't, don't arise as a result of people in the Cayman Islands needing it. These problems arise because these global clients around the world go to Cayman practitioners and they say, we have this problem. And so Duckworth saw this problem and said, look, I'm gonna design this thing that's going to help remedy a lot of these problems. And so 1997 comes around and he, he, he um, enacts this, gets this law enacted. Uh, and some of the, the funny sort of debates about it went on to say, funny quote actually, uh, I'll quote um, um, Matthews, which is a trust textbook from 2002, and they said the culture of that at the time was that law students learned two or three crisp sentences about the need for human beneficiaries, chuckled over a few called so-called so anomalous cases involving pet parrots, secular monuments, and fox hunting, and moved on. And so, you know, that was a 2002 thing about the um, trust textbook uh, referencing to what star trusts were or purpose trusts were. Um, and so by, uh, and, and a few years later, um, you could see that, you know, Offshore was practicing with these star trusts uh, to, to this, this popularity so much so that the textbooks had to rewrite themselves to acknowledge the power of these purpose trusts uh, and say that now, quote, non charitable purpose trusts or NCPs are big businesses. Many jurisdictions now recognize them by force of statute and that non charitable purpose trusts are perfectly valid in English law. The boot is now very much on the other foot. And that's from Matthews and uh, 2002 in the trust textbook. Um, uh, and, and so some, some textbooks have accepted that these trusts do exist, but it's still um, is not accepted by a lot of you know staunch trust scholars who think of them as traditional vehicles for traditional purposes or certain purposes. Uh, and so Hudson, I think it's Alistair Hudson, another trust textbook from uh, 2017 uh, that I think a lot of students read, uh, calls it quote a sickening pantomime 
and a purely tax motivated sham. So there's still arguments about it and there's still people who disagree with it. But I mean, if the proof is in the pudding and, and, and people with these hedge funds and other products are using it, you can't deny the power of these, these products. And so um, there is one example of this, this thing where you had this problem onshore, clients coming to an offshore jurisdiction, helping discover a solution and not only discovering it, but practicing into power so much so that when I went to a trust conference, the Society of Trust and State Planners held the conference in every January in the Cayman Islands. Um, they were introducing a new, a new product, a, a foundations company or a foundations trust company. And the, the trustees were putting up their hands trying to figure out what this new product was. And it was designed by the same and, and implemented by the same guy, Anton Duckworth again. Uh, and they said, you know, I go to my Chinese clients and they're savvy. They, 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 they don't want this new foundations product that came in as just legislated. They, they go, I want the Star Trust. Like, what does this foundations company do for me? Uh, and, and this is not what I want. And so the other trustees were saying that, you know, this is the same problem we had when we introduced the Star Trust 20, 30 years ago. Uh, you know, you have to educate them and tell them, you know, what this does. And while they'll still continue using the Star Trust, you have to continually twin it with the offering of this other new product that we have. And so what you're seeing is that this full, uh, what I call recursive cycle is happening in that, you know, there's a problem, there's a solution, uh, and they're all legal solutions. And, and, and it's, it's gone full circle in that now the norm is to use this particular offshore product. Uh, and I think that's been probably the most interesting find uh, in that. And so when I discovered that, I started digging into the uh, other sort of financial products. Um, a quick one is the asset-backed securities market and the need to use special purpose vehicles. An economic geographer named Thomas Wainwright in the UK uh, wrote about this phenomenon. And basically, it was about uh, the fact that uh, asset-backed securities needed a special purpose vehicle in order to um, uh, do the transaction it needed to do. But because the laws in the UK or EU were so difficult, it was uh, profitably, uh, just not profitable or not, 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 not usable. And so um, the people who had these products went offshore in order to access SPVs, special purpose vehicles, uh, to do these transactions. And when, when they saw that it was becoming popular and profitable, it was actually onshore professionals in London who lobbied for use of this type of, 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 of vehicle um, to, to, to have an exemption. And it, it, it became actually uh, accepted and, or passed. Uh, and so in that, in that article, you'll see that basically, again, a technical problem that was just too heavily regulated in an offshore jurisdiction using it um, and it becoming popular uh, and then having it uh, basically grabbed and re-imported or the best bits or the more successful bits uh, back into onshore. Uh, the last example I'm going to talk about is captive insurance, which I think is a, a really interesting thing. Uh, and I mentioned it earlier, but basically uh, captive insurance is incredibly popular because it mostly medical malpractice captives uh, in the 19, I think, again, probably the 60s. The Harvard Medical Group um, was uh, succumbed to quite a bit of medical malpractice, increasing fees for its doctors, hospitals, and nurses. And so at the time, captives was not a popular, uh, popular thing. And at the time, if you wanted to start your own captive insurance company, you were twinned uh, or coupled with the, the regular insurance laws. And so captives are very different from regular insurance products in that you're self-insuring yourself. And one of the big um, uh, uh, things that, that was really stuck with captive insurers was that you had to, to sell aside a lot of um, money for your captive. So you couldn't invest all of the premiums that you can, you know, if you collected a million dollars in premiums, you could reinvest all of that million dollars. You had to hold, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50% aside in cash uh, in order to pay out um, any premiums. Uh, and the risk profile based on that made it unprofitable to have a, a captive insurance in the US. And so this Harvard Medical Group of Hospitals uh, approached Bermuda at the time and said, you know, we saw that you did an insurance product for um, nuclear power plants. We'd like to do a medical one. And so Bermuda said no, uh, because they found this type of thing too risky or 
uh, just not in their best interest. And so this group approached Douglas Calder in the Cayman Islands. Um, I spoke to him a few years ago and he told me about the story from, you know, Horse's Mouth. Uh, and he said they, you know, came down, you know, had dinner with them, toasted to his health and they were off. And so it's these stories that you gather while, while in the Cayman Islands about, about these things that you read about that, that really were an individual um, interaction with another person that, that spawned this massive industry. And what you'll see now is that the Cayman Islands is the largest domicile in the world for, for captives uh, by the number of captives. But when you go to these captive conferences, as I, I had in the Cayman Islands, and talk to other states, states compete individually now for uh, captive, um, captive business. Uh, that the dollar value actually of captives is actually larger in Vermont, of all places, uh, than in the Cayman Islands. So Cayman might host a larger number of captives, but Vermont hosts dollar value more. And that's sort of similar to this Delaware Cayman thing where, you know, the number of companies hosted in the Cayman Islands is quite high, but actually if you look at Delaware, uh, it's much higher. Um, I think I'll stop here because I'm not sure how long I've been speaking for, Brian. Uh, and see if I can field any questions. I think it's been about 30 minutes, that's about uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much for that. It's very difficult to show appreciation in these circumstances, but there was a huge amount to unpack there. Uh, and I'm just wondering whether I count as an old school and entrenched trust scholar, but perhaps we can get to that later. Um, so we're now going to attempt to have uh, questions in light of that very stimulating presentation. So if you would like to indicate to me and to Daniel whether you'd like to ask a question verbally or you can type it and we'll be able to uh, read it out. Would anybody like to do either of those? Perhaps while we're warming up, can I just ask, when you talk to people there, are they pretty upfront about the suggestion that, well, what we're doing is avoiding tax, and that's fine because national tax regimes, you know, haven't caught up with us? Or is there an awareness that what they're doing is seen as unethical, at least by, by some? I think that was the um, the thing I found most difficult in that if you ask them about what they how they felt about being you know labeled as a tax haven they they become really you know they wouldn't want to talk to you they tell you to leave uh, but when I realized that actually if if you found interest in what they were actually doing so you know how does uh, what's the history of the hedge fund how did you, you know, how did you form your first hedge fund hedge fund here how did you manage it here what happened to your fund or the management of your fund during the financial crisis. They're more than happy to talk about the nitty gritty details and technicalities of what they do. And so as long as you get a grasp of, of, of some of the key terms or key cases that they've, they, they may have worked on or how key cases in the UK have affected how they work on these cases, they will talk to you for days about these things. And so I think it's the realization that uh, these professionals are, are pretty proud of the work that they do. Uh, but it, but, but tax is only tangentially related to all the things they do. It's sort of the last part of, of the benefit of, of, of doing business in offshore. And I think that's the, the sort of key message that they've been trying to get to the world. And of course, most people in the world don't agree with a lot of practices and that the end practice is that a lot of tax is deferred. Uh, but I've been, I try to avoid that while I'm down here because it just, you hit a wall and you're, you're never going to get a conversation like that. Uh, one of the, the more clever things that I've, I've, I've started to do uh, is that over the last four years, I've been taking the best of uh, the people that I found in the Cayman Islands and bringing them to Cambridge. And so they actually come to Cambridge annually uh, in September to the Economic Crime Symposium uh, that is hosted at Jesus College by, um, by Barry Ryder. It draws 1,500 uh, judges, lawyers, serious fraud offices, um, financial intelligence units from around the world who focus on anti-money laundering, terrorist financing. And so I have a couple of these Cayman panels and I put in provocative questions. And I, I have the Cayman panel speak to the world, uh, criminal economic crime prosecutors about what they actually do and you know, give them an opportunity to have a go at it. 
So that's been working actually quite well in that they've loved the fact that they've, you know, got a forum to talk about the Cayman Islands in a pretty, um, uh, you know, well thought out manner. Thanks, that's really interesting. I think that actually leads us nicely to the first question that we've got in the um, Q&A panel, which is uh, Rudu Chitapi wanting to hear a bit more about your ethnographic methodology and process and how easy it was to get people to talk to you. So uh, the, the process of ethnography. Uh, so I've actually been researching Cayman since actively since 2008. When I came down as a master's student, I had to affiliate myself with the local university college. And that helped me quite a bit to get access to a lot of locals and, and talk, to talk to people. But still, it didn't get me to the partners of all the top law firms. And that's what I was really interested in. I wanted to talk to the people who'd actually been in the Cayman Islands for 10, 20, 30 years over a couple of financial crises and who actually led these firms to, you know, to, to, to the world. And to get to them, uh, you had to have this, it helped significantly to have this Cambridge affiliation, but they, they, they also would judge you based on, you know, the first few minutes that they would talk to you. And so that means I had to develop a really strong language and understanding of whatever they did. So I had to do a lot of reading. Um, on trusts, I still know nothing about trust, but I can I, I can I can at least articulate you know the basic concepts of it. Uh, and same thing with captives and sort of other things uh, there. I also attended a lot of industry conferences, with, which helped them just see my face. Uh, it's a really small island, and when they're used to seeing you around, uh, they become more comfortable around you in these locations. Uh, the third thing I did was uh, a very clever uh, professor at Texas A and M. Uh, has started this course and has been running it for about 14, 15 years called Offshore Financial Transactions, where he brings his law students from Texas A&M to the Cayman Islands for a week uh, for, for credit. Uh, and he brings the people from the Offshore Financial Center uh, from in Cayman to, to present to these law students on exactly what they do. And so you're provided with these slides and PowerPoints and informal chats with with people that I was trying to get access to and people who had, you know, fairly big names in the Cayman Islands. Uh, so that was actually a brilliant thing. And this, this person, Andrew Morris, the professor, uh, who's now dean, of, dean there, uh, uh, has started the exact same course, but with um, Jer Jersey. So he brings his law students from America to Jersey every year now, and he's been doing it for the last two or three years to talk to the financial industry there. So there's some really clever stuff out there. You just kind of have to find it. But through that, I was able to ask questions as a, as a student uh, because I signed up for this course uh, and, and follow up with interviews and then through that um, networks. Uh, the other side project I've been working on uh, is uh, studying women in offshore uh, to understand the experiences of women in an offshore uh, financial center compared to women in metropolitan uh, financial centers. Uh, an anthropologist named Melissa Fisher, who's based in Copenhagen now, uh, has done this study and um, she chronicled the lives of women in Wall Street over a 40 to 50 year period. And so I thought I would do the same um, with that. And through that, I was able to interview them with that in mind, but also about their experience as just a financial professional in Canada. Okay, great, thanks. You'll see now that we've got quite a few questions in the Q&A panel. Perhaps you could sort of summarize the question and then answer it if they're uh, yeah, so Hans Bermo has talked about uh, Bermuda. So in at the time, Bermuda, uh, and I don't know a lot about the culture of Bermuda, but if a hospital captive went to you in the 1960s or 50s or 70s and, and they said, we have malpractice problems and we need to insure ourselves, it probably didn't sound palatable at the time and they probably wanted to move to a higher end or a nicer signing product for themselves. And that is why they, they likely rejected uh, re rejected this hospital group, but I suspect, um, um, you know, there may have been other reasons uh, based on the Bermuda uh, government at the time or what, what they wanted, but, but I do know that um, in an interview with William S. Walker that I found in the archives, uh, he did explicitly state that, you know, Bermuda's, uh, you know, mistake was our beef steak, and so he's quoted in, in one of those, and also in his autobiography as well. Um, a question from uh, Marco Greggi. And uh, Jaime, you mentioned that Cayman had 
more profitable instruments and they're invented and offered to the business community almost every year. Uh, how do you measure this pro profitability in terms of taxes saved? So I measure it based on um, uh, if it sinks or floats. Um, Cayman's not going to offer anything that, that, that doesn't, that the financial services industry isn't going to offer products or service that, that isn't profitable because uh, that's how they generate their income. They don't generate income um, you know, on, on performance of, of certain things. They generate income on fees charged based on their specialist knowledge uh, and their legal practices. And so if, if, a, if, a, you know, if, if a hedge fund makes a 10% profit, for example, that, that profit doesn't trickle to the practitioners in Cayman because the practitioners in Cayman, uh, they're all administrators of these funds. Uh, or these products, so they they get paid based on, um, you know, setting up the company, taking down the company, um, you know, uh, or you know, selling the company, but not based on the performance of the fund itself. They get paid based on administration um, fees. And so, what you'll see when I interviewed people was that uh, they actually make a lot of their their money on setting up and um, you know, taking down the fund. So you know, there's a life cycle or a business cycle of, a, of a, any financial business or product. And so they make their money there. But between that, they do um, uh, private equity deals. And so the, the, the life of a private equity deal is pretty short, I think three to five or 10 years if that. Uh, and so throughout the life of the deal, there are different tranches for things that have to happen. And when the Cayman lawyers are in part of that, they make money uh, through the, the processes as it goes through the steps, but not the performance of whatever happens. And there are a few further up. So I think Andy Summers, for example, has been waiting a while okay. to have his- Can you read it out because I can't see it? Oh, so there we go. He's Q &A. asking about the, sorry, have you got it? Yep, common reporting standards. So Andy yep. Summers, uh, what do you think has been the impact of common reporting standards on activities in Cayman and more generally, uh, what is the relation between business activities and personal wealth management as aspects of the Cayman avoidance evasion industry? Um, so one of the most difficult places to study here at the moment for me, and I, I'm not really focused too much on it, is private banking and uh, the people who manage uh, family, family wealth, or they're called family businesses or something. Uh, so I've not seen it yet, um, and I've attended quite a few trust conferences here. Uh, so I wouldn't be able, unfortunately, to re report on that at the moment. And the problem is that uh, you can see trends from, from, a, from an outsider's point of view, and you can see trends based on chatting on people, but those trends are based on the type of work that they're engaged in. So when I talk to all of these practitioners, uh, for example, a KPMG or, or a PWC down here, they can tell me that their, um, their groups are, are, are shrinking or, or expanding, for example, uh, during the after the financial crisis, um, they had to expand their bankruptcy and insolvency practitioners groups, and then they had to shrink it back down, you know, after five or six years. And so you can measure it based on the the, the expansion and the shrinking of certain groups within work, work groups, working groups within their businesses. Uh, but to be able to to figure that out is, I think, pretty pretty difficult. Um, yeah, so personal wealth management, there are a lot here. You can see it, private jets here galore. Uh, but yeah, how to measure it, I'm still working on it. I'd love to chat with you about that if you, you have further questions. Um, open questions, Darren Kemp. Um, the last financial crisis led the OECD to increase transparency and tax havens. The financial sector is now being called on to help COVID-19 support. Will COVID-19 improve the image of tax havens? I'm not sure in what respect, but I know that for a fact that anybody who's got, you know, a major pension fund here, sorry, a major pension fund in your home country is, is likely going to have used or used a Cayman entity. Uh, one of the guys I interviewed said, you know, the 10 commandments of a hedge fund was to open up a domicile in the Cayman Islands. It was just good business, good business, um, you know, acumen at the time. Uh, and it still is because it's, it's, it's a, they've got a team of specialists who've been doing it for 20 or 30 years. Uh, and so Cayman has a really interesting specialization in that it's basically just a, an arm of New York. And, um, you know, when talking to a professional a partner at a big law firm in Cayman, they said, you know, I, I don't want, if I'm a person in New York and I want 
I came in, a uh, lawyer working on me, I expect them to answer the call uh, when, I, when I meet them you know, 24 hours a day. And so, you know, Cayman reacts very quickly because they're on the same time zone, their same location, um, you know, two, two hours by flight, but they're reactive. And so they're, they're reactive as, 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 as excellent administrators. Um, I'm not sure how, yeah, if you could maybe be more specific with your question. Um, I, I don't know if it'll improve the image of tax havens. I'm, I'm not sure what that, that really means. Um, Julie Wood, have you experienced any reactions that the Caymans have made to the EU tax haven blacklist? So I've spoken to Jude Scott, who's the head of Cayman Finance in the Cayman Islands, and he's sort of the voice of most of the financial industry. Separate from government, they're, they're, you know, the government's opinion is distinct from Cayman Finance. Sometimes they, they, they work together on the same things. Um, and, and they do have lots of written work and they've employed a Oxford Economics, a company, not Oxford Economics, but a company called Oxford Economics based in New York uh, to do a lot of research for them. Uh, and uh, I think they're they're sort of doing that now, you know, getting research, and I commend them for at least getting research done. I've actually spoken to him and told him to read a lot of the stuff published by the same people that I read, uh, and to be ready for for you know difficult questions. Um, but I think there are the people have to realize that they are a very small island with a very very small group of people working on you know problems that are that are you know, really out of their scope and out of their reach in terms of answering these OECD and EU policies. And they are working hard and they are, they are always going to be attacked. Uh, and that, that means that they have to figure out where they want to focus all of their resources. Watching that happen from the ground here uh, is uh, pretty, pretty impressive. Um, but they're, they're, yeah, obviously, they're, they're, they're always going to be fighting this uphill battle and trying to figure out where they're going to be next in the next five or 10 years uh, is going to be interesting because I've been watching closely to figure out what this future of offshore is going to be like. And hopefully uh, for my next project is to figure out what the next offshore financial center will look like in a digital economy uh, when there's going to be a place like the Cayman Islands that ceases to exist in a physical form. So what would a digital offshore look like? And I think Cayman is trying to figure that out as well. And I'm trying to get a step ahead of that to figure out what that might be for, you know, other nations. Um, Peter Ringstead, uh, thank you for your interesting introduction. How does the local population feel about the large expat community and offshore financial community? It creates a lot of local jobs, but also increases the cost of living. Could you talk about this? And, and is there open local debate? Yeah, so uh, there's a really funny story that I'll tell you guys about uh, after I say that. Uh, the expat community uh, has a lot of uh, good work done here. They've introduced a lot of, you know, really good, um, you know, social programs and, and all these other things just as a result of the, the money that they're able to bring here. Um, and so Roy Bodden, uh, J.A. Roy Bodden, who used to be a politician here and then a, a president of the local community college, uh, who's also got a chapter in, in the book that I was in, talks about these, this expatriate tension between the, and, and, and local and expatriate tension. Um, Amit Varid Talai, who's an anthropologist in Canada, also writes about these tensions as well back in you know, 1995. And what you'll notice in Cayman compared to BVI and Bermuda is that these tensions are very slightly, are very different actually from each other. Uh, the, the BVI have this belonger status written into their law in that when you walk into the BVI airport, when you used to walk into the BVI airport, there was a lineup for passport control and it would say belongers or non-belongers. Uh, and Bill Maurer, an anthropologist, uh, wrote a book on that, Land, Law and Citizenship in the BVI, uh, about basically how, how the government and how the locals as a result of the laws enacted um, against the locals, you know, placed people. And so uh, Bermuda, for example, uh, you're not allowed to own a home or a car uh, in, in Bermuda and as, re, as an expat. And, and as a result, um, expats are all on mopeds or they live in houses behind houses. Uh, and so the treatment of expats is phenomenally uh, different in Cayman. They're very expat friendly. They've always been open to, um, to visitors here compared to other islands uh, in terms of work. And that really sets the tone of any expat who wants to come here 
either temporarily or for five years or for 10 years. Uh, and that, that, that's how the, the island develops culture. So they appreciate them. And of course, there are lots of, um, you know, animosities amongst different things about, um, you know, uh, Caymanians not getting jobs for, um, you know, from that, that they, they think that they're qualified for and losing them to um, expats. Uh, that, that dialogue will always be there. The funny story is that, you know, how do they feel now? Because we've been on lockdown for about two months and that we've had a, a curfew uh, which means we have to be in our homes by 7 p.m. and it's been going on for about two months now. Uh, as of today, we're uh, half of us are allowed on the beach for two hours. Um, but the the funny thing is that uh, Cayman was lacking kits, and so we did not have any testing capacity, and our medical supplies to do testing for COVID-19 were blocked uh, by the U.S. And like every small island, we were struggling with getting um, access to kits. So the local billionaire here, Ken Dart, who is the um, heir to the styrofoam, the Dixie Cup styrofoam fortune, worked with a local um, businessman and a couple politicians to acquire kits. Uh, I think about 200 or 300,000 kits for an island of 60,000 people in South Korea. And to get that kit from South Korea to Cayman, he uh, loaned his private jet, <laughs> which <laughs> flew the kit to Alaska and then down to Cayman. So if you Google the Cayman Compass News and Dart, uh, you'll read about that story. And so it's about the, the harmonious, you know, relationship between the locals and the expats where, you know, in times like this, when, you know, you're able to get the power of this, this, this person. To, to bring these much needed medical supplies here to do the testing. Uh, it's, you know, it's happening right now and it's tenuous, but right now they really do appreciate the business community uh, for one example of that. Um, question for, from Guy. Meg, can you say some more about what you unearthed from interviewing and talking to Caymanian citizens? Um, I think there's a different, different uh, groups of Caymanian citizens that I've been able to talk to. Um, I've got a lot of friends here now who are not in the financial industry at all. They're musicians, artists, um, and in the tourism industry. Uh, and ge generally they see that the spending here has, has, has helped with their local economy in that, you know, Cayman is pretty well developed. It's got pretty nice roads uh, compared to other islands. And all this is, is a result of the money that's being brought in by the clients of the financial industry and the tourism as a result. You come here for your annual board meeting, for your hedge fund, you stay for a week at the Ritz with your family. You know, you spend probably $20,000, $30,000 in that week. So they, they, they produce tourism for the economy at a very high level that other islands um, don't, don't get as much to. Um, uh, so I think in the last, uh, Sorry, the, the guy question just disappeared. Yeah, so there's a mixed bag because there are a lot of very smart Caymanians here too, and a lot of them do end up in the financial industry. Uh, one of the common things that, that really happens here is that Caymanians go abroad, they go to the US, Canada, the UK to do their schooling and education, and then they come back. And if they can, a lot of them do, uh, end up working for these financial industries. Um, and there are lots of programs there for them to, to get in there. And so when you talk to the, the partners in these, these financial industries, they'll say that they're desperate for Caymanians uh, or competent and qualified Caymanians. And that, and that it's, it's really hard to get the good ones because they get snapped up easily. And so there's a very highly educated Caymanian population, which are doing very well. Uh, but then there's also a, a not as educated or a trades educated Caymanian who's, who's doing moderately well. And then there's, there's you know, probably quite a few who are less educated, who are likely struggling. Um, and, and so there, there are these different uh, gradations of acceptance of the financial industry based on the type of industry and employment you're in and to the type of immediate benefit that you get from, from this industry. Um, I'm gonna answer a question from uh, Rodrigo. Uh, did you see the investigative journalist sources for doing your series? Did, did I use investigative journalistic sources for doing my research? Uh, what's, what's your or your participants in the media coverage on tax havens? Um, Panama paper, I'm thinking of Panama papers or Paradise papers. Um, 
they don't like, they don't like journalistic like, media. I think there was a BBC documentary on the Cayman Islands that was done a few years ago. A guy came down here, interviewed some guy in a Ferrari, uh, and I talked to a group of, uh, I joined the women in insolvency and restructuring here. And that's how I met a group of, you know, 50 women here who, who basically clean up the messes of all the crises. They're, they're all bankruptcy and insolvency experts. And they were talking about this, this coverage on the BBC and how poor reporting it was. And, and I think the, the, the problem with, with the, the, the media pieces is that they come down here and they spend a few weeks here at most and they, and they leave with the story. But they don't, they don't actually get as much time to, to talk to the people and observe these things. And so I guess the advantage for my PhD was that I've, I've cumulatively spent, you know, three or four years down here. I've spent a lot of time talking to people and I've attended a lot of local conferences and I've really gotten a sense of, of, of what's happened here. And as a result, I've, I've, built, I've, I've been able to gain a lot of trust and I've not had to use, um, you know, tactics that maybe media have, have tried to, to use, maybe undercover exposés. I've, I've not done any of that. Uh, I've done it in a pretty, pretty clear and transparent way. Uh, and I think as a result, uh, it means I won't be kicked out of the island, for example. And, you know, they'll continue to talk to me. I've created forums for the, the Cayman folks to come to Cambridge to talk about their work. And I will continue to create these forums so that they can speak on their behalf and on, on, you know, by themselves uh, to, 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 to the world on, on actually what they do. And I think that's a much better approach because, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you have these islands shut down and not talk to the outsiders completely, and that's been the problem with a lot of these islands, uh, you know, it's, it's never going to work to, to resolve any of these um, uh, tensions that are between offshore and onshore. Uh, and I think a, an open dialogue, if I can create it, um, using ac academic um, you know, forums, uh, I think is going to be helpful in the long run in that we're going to be able to access more information, ask them for more information and get it, uh, and to you know, have an easy line to actually talk to people uh, to get it. So rather than digging through um, old uh, you know, Bank of International Settlement statements, which I think Zupin does, which is, which is you know, a good, good methodology, uh, I'm hoping that one day we'll be able to, you know, get access to pieces of information that, that you know, you wouldn't normally be able to get access to by, you know, reaching out to a group or an individual in Cayman to, to, to talk about. Um, a question from Rohan. Thanks, May. That was an informative presentation. You're welcome. Uh, have you managed to gauge how offshore professionals in the Cayman view the legitimacy of the transnational normative framework? And how have their their legal financial practices um, navigated Cayman's stigmatization as a tax haven. So one of the interesting things uh, that I've noticed uh, over the, I think I did about 50 or 50 formal interviews, uh, was that the first thing that they would tell me is that we're not a tax haven. And, and, and sometimes throughout the, at the end of the conversation, they would let out and say, you know, the tax is a benefit. And they would say something to that to that degree, but it was always, we are not a tax haven. And it's because they've gone through decades and decades of the defensive of going, oh, OECD blacklist, what about Switzerland, what about the US and all these other things, that they've, they've not had time to develop these other conversations that they so desperately need to have with the world in that they're stuck on these different tiers. And that's interesting because that's what Jude Scott at Canon Finance has been trying to do. He gives these marketing talks around the world about you know what Cayman does, and it's this very basic infographic of five or six things. And and you know there's a basic level of conversation that you can have to say we are not a tax haven, we are not a tax haven. And then there's like the second and the third and the fourth level of conversation where you can actually talk about very um, you know detailed aspects of your law that are um, inflammatory or um, you know not not beneficial to certain countries. And I think those conversations are really difficult to get through because Cayman feels as if it needs to cut through the to, through through all these layers of conversation and it has to figure out uh, how you position yourself and how you're going to frame them after your conversation with them. Um, and that's why it's so difficult to get access to locals and local practitioners uh, who are actually you know uh, operating here. Um, so yeah, at the moment they're still on the defensive. Uh, Victoria. Have you gained an impression of the extent to which the financial sector lobbies and influences the government on the Cayman Islands and how their political influence is perceived? 
Uh, I think locally people realize that because you're such a small village, you are going to go to school and your kids are going to go to school with the ministers and the finance people and other law firms and competing law firms. And so you have to understand that the culture of this place is that it's a small village, but they are trying as best as they can coming from South Africa, uh, the US, uh, Australia, Canada, New Zealand to practice in a, in a, in a manner matter um, and, and you know, confidentiality and all of the, these other things. Um, and it's, it's hard to separate uh, the influences because the government relies quite heavily on the private sector to develop its laws, to give feedback on a lot of its policies, uh, because the government really, you know, is interested in the financial services sector insofar as how it can bring um, money to its economy and to support its locals and development of its locals. And so, you know, they are pretty intertwined. They, quite, they try to be separate. But if you look at other small economies around the world, small island states particularly, there is a group of people who study the culture of small island states. Uh, the ISA, I think they're called, the Institute of Small Island States. Uh, it is a very different way of doing things. And the reason why uh, we become so fascinated with Cayman compared to other small island states is because it just happens to be, you know, the top five, one of the top five financial centers in the world. So it's a weird small, you know, small, small, small world, big money type of thing. And economic geographers like Susan Roberts, for example, and Thomas Rain write, um, write pretty brilliantly on, on that culture, on how to figure your an offshore financial center out based on that. Uh, Lata um, says, uh, following, following these expats, did you try to go beyond understanding them in their professional roles or following Dominic Boyer's manifesto of aiming to understand them as entire human beings? Uh, I would really be interested to know what, what were your fieldwork considerations. Yeah, so when I began, I started studying elite research, sort of elite theories, uh, and I realized that studying elites wasn't actually really my interest. I wasn't interested in studying the, the billionaires or the multimillionaires who used the Cayman Islands. I was actually interested in the local practitioners and the professionals. And so I started looking at professionals research, and that's where I found um, more uh, easily used uh, work by um, two, two, two people I, I go guided by, but it's um, Transnational Legal Orders by Terry Halliday and Greg Schaefer. Uh, so that's been a really good help for understanding like the structure. Uh, and then a really good case study has been done by Terry Halliday and Bruce Tablers on bankrupt. And basically the global financial, um, the sort of the Asian financial crisis basically made them realize that, you know, we need global bankruptcy norms and they follow, you know, uh, South Korea, China, and a couple of other countries on how they implemented these like legal norms, uh, bankruptcy codes, and how they were actually practiced by locals or, um, or, or, or rejected by locals and all the local things that happened that fed into the national and then to the global norms. Uh, so I looked at these types of legal feedback loops um, through those two um, authors. Um, the other thing I did was I combined a lot of anthropological work uh, using ethnography and that was based on Bill Maurer and George Marcuse who are based at UC Irvine and I was actually there for about eight months before I started my PhD so they've influenced me heavily on what I do. Uh, George Marcus has something called para-ethnography uh, and para-ethnography basically means uh, studying people uh, who are just as, you know, if not more clever than you uh, who work in fields that are similar to yours. So in traditional ethnography, uh, you look at um, man's law and he, he, he goes and he studies tribes and villages, he studies you know, cultures. But when you start studying people who are lawyers and who are fund administrators, um, people who, who do you know, complex calculations on a daily basis, they're not going to, 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 to accept some of the types of questions that you'd be able to answer, sorry, be, be able to ask um, people in other ethnographic environments. Uh, and so para-ethnography offers a solution to that. And if you Google that, you'll be able to, to see the types of things that happens with that. But, but one of the things, the features of para-ethnography is that you engage with them and figure out things with them and they help you figure out things by these more long, detailed and deep academic -y, uh, conversations. Uh, para uh, or multi-sided ethnography 
is basically another thing that I did was basically following these people around the world, but specifically I invited them to Cambridge. I took them out of their Cayman comfort zone. A lot of them work in London. Uh, and so bringing them to Cambridge and having them talk about the Cayman Islands uh, in that other site was, I think, one of the more, uh, you know, successful things I was able to accomplish. Uh, and to have them talk about it uh, on, you know, on my behalf helped me significantly. And then I could study how they perceive the audience reactions to that as well. Um, and then a question from Dominic. Uh, what is the attitude it came into the Privy Council? Is the UK legal involvement a help or hindrance to the work of professionals? Uh, and then how does this work for US clients? Uh, this is a really interesting question because Cayman really, I think that there's, there's a respect for the Privy Council and there's a respect for the courts here. And one of the things that the lawyers and even London lawyers who get seconded to Cayman for work say is that there's just not enough people here. There are not enough judges, so the cases get backlogged. The financial services division in courts here are, you know, extremely adept and they, they get a lot of work doing complex cases. And um, you'll, if you read certain cases about cases that go to the Privy Council, um, I think some of the comments from the lawyers here have basically said that, you know, these offshore uh, judicial systems are actually financial, for the financial services industry, are, are, are really advanced and technical. And when they head to the Privy Council, sometimes they feel like their wings are clipped and that they've got to go back to more traditional th thoughts and structures. Uh, and so I think there's a bit of a tension there and that offshore is moving rapidly and cases in offshore in the financial services division are moving rapidly. But if you have to go to the Privy Council, uh, sometimes you'll find that the, the, the layer of thoughts, um, you know, are not as open or tuned to some of the thoughts that are developing offshore. So sometimes there's this feeling that the Privy Council is, you know, this clipping of the wings and you'll see, see that term used in some of the academic articles um, about that. Uh, and then the second question was the US. Well, the US love using Cayman because uh, it's a you know different legal structure which they have access to. And one of the things I was gonna add was that the reason why bankruptcy and insolvency is popular here is because you can claim something called a chapter 15 bankruptcy in Cayman uh, or a, yeah, chapter 15, I think. But basically, if you claim bankruptcy in Cayman, you can claim an American style bankruptcy. And once you claim that, you have access to all the Cayman, sorry, all the American laws and all the American legislation in your hands. And that means the US will respect any uh, sort of chapter 15 uh, American style bankruptcy that you declare in Cayman, uh, and then uh, basically support any request for documents or information. So you have the power of American um, law at your hands and regulators at your hand in order to enforce uh, any orders that you have in Cayman uh, based on that. And so that's why you've got this mix of British and American law with the force of American regulation and power to get whatever you need. Well, thank you very much. You said when we started that you wanted to incite a lot of discussion and you've certainly done that and worked extremely hard in answering all of those questions. The topic was obviously of a huge level of interest to people from lots of different disciplines. Uh, so it's been a great pleasure to boost you, even if it's virtually, and thank you so much for all the effort you've put into the talk and uh, to answering all the questions. It's been really fascinating for me. So thank you very much to May and thank you to everyone for coming. And hopefully the Social Legal Group will have more events either like this or physically in the not too distant future. So thank you very yeah. much. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, everyone. And we, we're, we're in our tax group in Cambridge. We're trying to get a, a virtual one started as well. So if you're interested in more tax-related things, it'll get posted in the next one or two weeks. Um, our website is tax, 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 dot tax, and uh, it'll uh, it'll be live in a few weeks with some more, hopefully, semi-weekly discussions. Great. Okay. So very easy to remember web address at least. So. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Right. See you all soon.